uh, first of all, I would like to, to thank um, Elaine for having offered me this, uh, the chair of this panel, of this inaugural conference, which is very important for all of us uh, in the Institute. And if I may add a personal remark, I would like to, to thank her um, very deeply for having offered me this unique opportunity to be here for doing research in such an enlivening and creative uh, environment full of uh, energy, as Ellen said, and uh, a young researcher. It's really a rejuvenate uh, bath for me being here. And so, Ellen, un grand merci vraiment à toi. Um, the chair, uh, we are now, so they, uh, the panel uh, we are conveyed is about uh, the, the, the inside of the decision making process. So, the, behind the curtain, what is behind the, uh, the judicial decision? So, the decision making process, which is also a law making, law -making process. And uh, I would uh, I would uh, ask uh, our speakers, I don't think they, ne they need any presentation, actually. Uh, they are well-known, renowned uh, professors, uh, international judges, uh, to, uh, to, to speak about uh, three main subjects. And these uh, three main subjects, I would uh, say, the first is, who are the judges? How are they appointed? Uh, how they are elected? Uh, where do they come from, uh, which is the composition of the bench. So the, the catchword would be mm, common law versus uh, civil law background, academics uh, versus uh, diplomats uh, uh, background, so the legal training and their former um, professional experiences. But, but I think, well, I, don't, I wonder if now today Nowadays, it really makes uh, such a big difference anymore. We have witnessed it, witnessed it uh, many times. A uh, former professor who then took with gusto their new, um, their new uh, profession as international arbitrators. And, and we know international arbitrators, so practitioners, practicing lawyers, who fancy themselves as big... Uh, thinkers and even philosophers. So I, I wonder if it's difference between academic background, um, diplomatic background, governmental background is really that important. I think a, an interesting uh, aspect would be to see also if it's a matter of uh, their outlook, their ideas, their personality, is a, is a, their function is a matter of age, is a matter of gender, uh, is a matter of their cognitive bias. Uh, so to enlarge the, the, the investigation on these different um, aspects, which goes further. So who are the judges? It would be my first uh, uh, cluster of questions. The second is, what do they think they are? Which, which is their their own perception, what do they think they are for, what do they stand for? And so is the old question, we all know, the difference between uh, uh, ad an adjudicatory body, adjudication as a main uh, judicial function, or arbitration. Once again, this distinction is not that uh, clearly focused uh, anymore, or as it could have been former times. Uh, the International Court of Justice is from time to time, uh, every now and then, criticized for having this arbitration outlook and forgetting its uh, adjudicatory mission, so to say, on one side. Uh, and so it's blurring the line between uh, uh, arbitration and adjudication is, uh, is a moving, moving, is shifting from one side to the other. On the other, another example of ICSID, uh, one would think it's just arbitration, uh, but now we are witnessing this, this growing tendency to understand, it's, uh, from the investment tribunal, to, under 
to understand themselves uh, as uh, adjudicator in creating a, a system or a subsystem of international law. So, uh, but still, I think, still this uh, main divide, adjudication on one side, arbitration on the other side, is important, still important to understand what, what the judges think they are for, what do they do actually, and so, and so the importance of the applicable rules. Uh, procedural rules, how procedural rules uh, constrain or on the other side uh, encourage uh, judges to develop, um, a, a, to understand and develop this law creating um, function they have. Um, in order to, to, to convince Bruno to enhance a little bit his, uh, his um, faith, not faith, but his, let's say his, his pleasure in, in pro procedure, um, I would like to, to quote what once Lauterpacht said. And he said that a procedure is to litigation what cooking is to food. And so, you see, there is more to, to procedure than one could think. Uh, just from the so, uh, first, uh, at first sight. Uh, so it, it depends very much how the procedures rules are shaped uh, in order to, to understand the, the margin of, of liberty, the margin of appreciation, the margin of discretion uh, the judges uh, are enjoining. Uh, the, the aspect of, uh, of uh, judicial activism, uh, versus uh, judicial self-restraint. Procedural rules are also a, is, are at the core of this, um, of this subject. Not only procedural rules, of course, are important, but obviously uh, substantial rules. And so here again, I would like to, to, uh, to, to talk and to, to, to hear and to, to discuss uh, the views of our, of our speakers about uh, uh, how judges are developing uh, the substantive rules, uh, which means do they have to do that? We, once again, which liberty they have at creating new uh, law, uh, developing custom, uh, the role of precedents, uh, uh, they, they, um, the possibility of reversal of, uh, of uh, settled jurisprudence, and so on. The, the third uh, the, the, the importance uh, which um, dissenting opinion could have, individual opinions could have. Mm -hmm. uh, the third, uh, the third uh, cluster of questions is what do others think uh, judges are, or what do other things judges are for? Bentham said at the end of the 18th century that law is not made uh, by judge alone, it's made by judge and company. And so it would be interesting to see who is the company of the judges nowadays. We have heard, once again this morning, that uh, a, an important person could, could be the, the clerks, the assistants of the judges, is a very little investigated uh, uh, subject. And, uh, and Bruno this morning uh, used the, the expression of uh, invisible minions, so it's interesting to see this new perspective from the invisible college of international law to the invisible minions of international law. Interesting new perspective. So, of course, then, who are surrounding the judges, who are helping the judges to take decisions of clerks, uh, registry, of course, the role of register, but then different actors, uh, different stakeholders, like the parties, of course, first, but then also third states, uh, domestic judicial bodies, uh, civil society at large. And so this would be the third cluster I would like to, to discuss. So who are the judges? Uh, what do they think they are? Uh, and the third, what do others think judges are, uh, international judges are? I would like to, uh, to welcome uh, Judge Bonisho for having joined us, and I'm, I apologize that we started just I a couple apologize. of, uh, <laughs> of minutes uh, before his arrival. And so, uh, now, who wants to, uh, to take uh, the floor for the first round of, uh, of discussion? Who are the ju international judges? <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Andrea. 
uh, who are perhaps unbiased. Uh, I am uh, certainly would consider myself, uh, and I'm seen that way also, as an academic with a very thin coat of practitioner, uh, and certainly that influences my view on the system. Generally speaking, uh, those international courts and tribunals I know, is, oh, they are, always have been composed in a rather pluralistic way. Since I happen to be in a court uh, with 21 judges, we are even more pluralistic, at least by numbers, uh, than the International Court of Justice. We have people from the academic side, uh, mostly professors. Uh, we have also former legal advisors, diplomats, and uh, yes, uh, diplomats which never served as uh, legal advisors. That makes a difference. But we also have a particular breed, namely those who participated in the Law of the Sea Conference and those who did not. And this makes quite a difference. Now, in which, which respect? First of all, I start with the last group. Those who have participated in the Law of the Sea Conference have a certain tendency to emphasize or even overemphasize the legislative history when we, etc. This is not always helpful, but this will be cured by time. Although, uh, obviously, the Law of the Sea Conference participation has for a result that people are getting quite old. <laughs> Hugo Caminos, who was recently, he's not anymore with us, uh, visited the tribunal. He, said he is 93 years old and gave a fabulous speech about his uh, professional career starting as an assistant, of, you all will not believe that, of Hans Kelsen. Uh, this is quite something. That's one point. The other point is, and this is, those who are professional, particularly professional legal advisors, have a certain tendency to be cautious and take into consideration uh, perhaps more than those who come from the academic background, what the judgment, or I speak also for arbitration, the award may be or may mean for future cases. Uh, whether they may deter future cases to come or whether they may have a negative impact on the future development of international law. But in general, at least uh, in this goes already to your next pillar, the majority is uh, rather ready uh, to promote international law, uh, in this case, law of the sea, and they use mostly these blanket uh, provisions, open provisions, which are open for interpretation. If you say it mildly, in reality, you have to fill these provisions. But here we have another problem. When it comes to, i just pick one example. If you come to the interpretation of the word reasonable, I've never counted how often the word reasonable it turns up in the Law of the Sea Convention quite frequently, uh, those coming from common law take a totally different approach from the ones like myself coming from the European system and having served, uh, as the case was for me, as administrative court judges. The first case, we had a long several days on this question where the common law judges all were agreeing that reasonable means, reasonable is what a reasonable person belonging to a reasonable club considers reasonable. They thought that to be totally sufficient. What uh, uh, French-oriented or German-oriented lawyers would see in reasonable is totally different. And if you look into the outcome of this case and following cases, uh, we met somewhere in between. I believe 60% in Europe and 40% in common law. But this is uh, perhaps, uh, I'm biased. But uh, this is an interesting solution. Last point, I uh, so to leave to others some uh, room, is to what extent does a tribunal which is specialized 
has a limited jurisdiction, which I want to emphasize, how does this tribunal or the judges of this tribunal look upon the ICJ? Uh, you didn't raise that question, but for the self-understanding of ourselves, that's very important. At the beginning, we considered the ICJ as the big, yes, as nearly a big god to which we look up, uh, although we don't always fully agree. In the second phase, we considered uh, that we should uh, try to develop our own profile. Uh, the uh, most important case in that respect is the Southern Bluefin tuna case. Uh, you may not know about it. It's not very relevant anyway. But here, the tribunal dealt with a precautionary principle. And here we clearly deviated from the jurisprudence from the, of the ICJ, and we did so on purpose. And we continued that in the advisory opinion as well as in the uh, advisory opinion on deep sea bed mining and the most recent advisory opinion on fishing. Again and again, hammering down what we thought is customary international law in this respect. Last point. Uh, what we also did, uh, that we have, we look more to the ILC occasionally than to the ICJ. Uh, we have a just kind of a permanent struggle within the tribunal, what is customary international law? And we mostly come to the decision what the ILC says is customary international law. You may disagree with that, but that's a way out. At least this, the majority, is more ready to accept than anything else. And uh, here you have, again, uh, the attitude that uh, we try to find our own uh, feature Lastly, where we step beyond uh, the uh, jurisprudence of the ICJ and arbitration is a question of, very technical question, whether we can provide or decide on a delimitation in areas of the continental shelf beyond 200 nautical miles. We decided in the case of Bangladesh, Myanmar, yes, this was followed by uh, the arbitration Bangladesh, India, which is not too astonishing since three judges belong to the same group, so to speak, the same panel. But now it's for the ICJ to, to decide that. There is a case pending before the ICJ where this question comes up. Uh, here, this is a question whether we have grown up or not. And I believe by speaking about the law of the sea tribunal, I've already explained a bit about the self-understanding of the judges. We have had, so far, never a case where we split common law, continental law, never. And we've never had a split, although we split frequently, on uh, the dividing line academics, non-academics. We always split rather differently for different reasons. I hope I gave it a start. Thank you. Who would like to take the floor now? on this uh, first uh, pillar. Fausto? Thank you, Andrea. Uh, let me first um, thank uh, Hélène for the invitation to come to this uh, workshop. Um, I'm very grateful to have been invited, but let me take also the opportunity, as I had some role in the formation of the Institute, the Master and Gesellschaft gave me some role in this respect. Uh, let's express my joy and satisfaction of seeing Hélène, uh, director of the... As I was happy to see uh, Burkert, uh, uh, the first director in, uh, in the Institute. I think this is very uh, good... Uh, I think uh, it's a very good achievement, and I think it's a premise for uh, a con precondition for uh, having a great success in the institute dedicated to procedure, which is the first time there is an institute of this kind on procedure, and I'm particularly pleased of that because uh, um, I don't want to go back to what I said this morning, but if I had to put the scale, I would put a 10 inevitably for as, um, as far as I'm concerned, because unlike Bruno, I'm a, a procedure addict 
in a way. Uh, as of the beginning, I graduated on procedure, I gradu uh, went on writing on procedure, and uh, uh, tend to see the, the, the world from the angle, the legal world, from the angle of procedure, maybe following a maxim that certainly Alain knows very well, the famous French lawyer who said, voila le firmament, le reste est procedure. Uh, so the basis, uh, you have a basis, but the rest you have to, to build on it, and it's just procedure. Well, but coming to the, to the question that Andrea put, uh, who are the judges? I may agree and will not repeat of many of the things that uh, Rudiger has said, because uh, it's clear the composition, I mean, is more or less the same in all the courts. There is a, a different composition. I would only add that uh, he maybe did not refer to a component which is uh, um, quite frequent in international jurisdictions, uh, besides, uh, the, uh, besides former judges at the domestic level, academics, uh, and uh, maybe practitioners of law, which is also uh, important. But we remain in the field of lawyers, actually. But frequently, uh, because of the procedures, again, for elections, um, uh, diplomats or former diplomats are members. And um, in general, I uh, have seen that it's not a good component in general. Because on one hand, the diplomats tend, having served one government all their life, they tend either to follow, again, uh, governments, not necessarily their government, but governments, governmental position, or they go the other side, not to be seen as uh, uh, too lenient to governments. They completely uh, lose the control of the environment in which they work. So um, this coupled with the fact that normally they are not specialists of law, uh, uh, in their makes them a component which is sometimes affecting the decisions in wrong, uh, in wrong ways and not uh, keeping the court to, uh, to respect fully the law or the objectives. But uh, uh, let me say, coming from a criminal court, uh, that uh, maybe a criminal court has a different... Uh, um, status as other courts that decide the disputes between states or between an individual at the state, as may be the court in uh, human rights courts. And I noticed the difference because before being a, a judge in the ICTY and the ICTR, I served for many, many years in the Human Rights Committee of the United States, which is a quasi-judicial body at least when it deals with individual communications. And, um, and, and it's more or less in the same position of the court in, in Strasbourg, except for the, for the uh, enforceability of the decision that, that it takes. Um, it's sometimes uh, in, uh, is the case in, the, in, a, in a criminal court, that, uh, and here procedures plays, uh, substance and procedure play a, a, a great role uh, and require uh, judges that are fully professional in law because any uh, diplomatic aspect should be, uh, remains out of any deliberation. Maybe not the same in a case, uh, in cases uh, of courts that settle uh, disputes between states, where there may be a consideration of diplomatic aspects, but uh, in, um, in, in a criminal court, this is clearly out of the picture, although there are problems that may uh, be uh, also involving the, the position of states. But um, uh, what uh, uh, required uh, competence is competence that normally people do not have. And that's uh, the, 
I hope this institute will be able to fill the gap and form people in that sense, having competence in different legal systems. Because when you take decision in criminal matters, you have a procedural problem. The basic procedural problem is the procedure. And you have the world split in different systems, which are not easily, uh, cannot easily go together. Common law and civil law do not easily go together. And uh, if you look at the statutes of the criminal courts, uh, the International Criminal Court has a statute that tries to merge the two systems, starting from the civil law system and putting common law into it. Apparently, it does not work well. In the ICTY, the experience was the opposite. The ICTY started with a common law, and again, common law, with some caveat, is American common law. Uh, it's not English common law. Started with American common law and tried to put, to inject uh, civil law uh, elements in. And again, it worked yes, no. Uh, if you look only at the duration of the cases, uh, the duration of the cases has increased. At the beginning, it was said the common law system is too lengthy, doesn't work. So let's inject some civil law elements in it. And the result is that the cases are longer. So it clearly, either something was done wrongly or it, didn't, or it doesn't work, uh, work uh, fully. So we, uh, I think uh, that type of courts at least needs uh, um, uh, people expert in more than one system. So the comparative approach becomes, uh, uh, in my view, a precondition in a way for serving well in this, uh, uh, in this course. I can give a lot of examples of this, but uh, uh, people that are working in one system tend to apply that system. Even if the conditions do not allow to apply that system. Uh, take a criminal case for crimes like international crimes. It's clear that in a common law system, you would never have a case of this kind dealt with without a jury. Now, you don't have a jury in international court. Applying a common law system doesn't work, clearly, if you apply it strictly. It cannot work because all the rules of evidence are wrong. The rules of evidence are there to protect the jury, <laughs> not for other purposes. A strict rules to protect the jury. So you have to invent new, new, new systems. And um, it's very difficult to, to do it. It's very difficult to explain to a person proficient in one system only how they don't have to follow the system completely. <laughs> because there are some conditions that are different in, in, the, um, in the system. Well, but I may go to other issues later on the other pillars of your Thank you, presentation. If, Thank if you, I may, Dave. If I may intervene, what, what you said just raised a, a very fundamental question, which is how far can you compare an international criminal court with other international judicial bodies? Does it really belong to the ideas we have of uh, international adjudication. It's not an interstate dispute, and it's not even a, a court where an individual has access as, as a claimant. The individual is the defendant. And so there, I think that what we said about the foremost importance of procedural rules is in, in the comparison to other courts where procedural rules could be dealt with a little more lightly. It is fundamental there because it's really our rights, individual rights of, of a person, of individuals who rights of defense himself. And so, again, the divide uh, academics or um, diplomats. Diplomats is not only a matter that do not know very much the law, it's also that they are, they are really their they are, they are ideas of, of, of what they are doing is totally different from that from uh, a lawyer or from, from a previous judge, and so on. All the examples you made made me thought that made, made, made me think that really 
it's time to, to consider also if it's uh, meaningful to, and how far is it meaningful to bring international criminal courts in our design. It's a matter of methodology. I still think that we really need a new methodology to investigate matters of uh, international judicial function and, and to ask which, are we, uh, which courts are we taking into consideration. And then would be a broader question, of course, that we let you, I, I just give sort of the input for further discussion. But on this first uh, subject, uh, who are the judges? Uh, Laurence, you wanted to, yeah, to intervene. Maybe I could bring something. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Hélène for uh, inviting me and inviting all the friends who are around because we are among friends. And uh, there was a direct link between Paris and Geneva, and now there will be one between Geneva and Luxembourg. So this is very nice. Um, yeah, listening to um, Rudiger, and I was thinking, yes, when we look at the statute of the International Court of Justice and we teach it, when we look at also the statute of ITLOS, the, law, the Tribunal on the Law of the Sea, we see that, in fact, the profiles that the state had in mind was former diplomats, former legal counsels, advisors, and academics. Okay. And though this, I think, is interesting, and it has a certain reason, but as Hélène say this morning, sociology is very important. And then I was thinking, so who are the ones sitting on the other courts and tribunals? And drawing a bit from my experience and from my readings, I was thinking, now, uh, who are the people that I've met when uh, I'm sitting uh, in arbitration cases? A lot of them are coming from law firms. Huh? They are coming from law firms, they are litigators. And this is, I think, very interesting because they have a certain sense of what is uh, dealing with evidence. They know how to cross-examine. So that is something which is interesting and quite typical from arbitration. Now, uh, speaking about WTO and Robert House, is, surely we'll say more about that. When you look at the statute of WTO and when you look at the composition of the panels and even of uh, the appellate body, you see that you have a lot of governmental representatives who are sitting on the panels, not exclusively, but governmental representatives. And this has a certain sense, it, it, has, it, it has a certain meaning. Now, when you, and Judge Benichot will speak about it surely, but the Luxembourg court, but also the, the criminal courts, you have domestic judges who are sitting on this court, so it's another type of actors. And if you look, for example, at the new proposal of the EU with respect to the investment court, what they're targeting, in fact, is domestic judges. So domestic judges, that means something for states. So I think it would be interesting to know what is behind that. Now, thinking about other dispute settlement mechanisms, and I'm thinking, for example, of... Uh, the Indus uh, um, dispute settlement procedure, uh, there was first a mediation, and it was done by an engineer, okay? And then there was an arbitral tribunal, and the, on the arbitral tribunal, Bruno was sitting on this arbitral tribunal, but there was also a, scientific, a scientist who was sitting on this tribunal. And it's often given as an example that this was something which was interesting because he was a non-lawyer explaining the technical matters. Now, having now some experience with the sport arbitration world, it's interesting because it's not just lawyers. There we also have uh, former uh, skiers, former people who have been involved in sports, who are now sitting, doctors, and so on. And that, you know, made me think, and I was just thinking about the cases which are now brought before the International Court of Justice, maybe also before ITLOS, and thinking, isn't it time now to change also the composition of these institutions? Isn't it time also to have people with a scientific background? And, uh, and that also, I have that in mind because, uh, as we know, we have more and more interfaces between judges and experts. And this is going to be a growing phenomenon. And I think that there is a great risk of contracting out because a lot of this knowledge now is detained by experts who are not sitting on the bench and they should not be sitting on the bench. So the cross-fertilization, how far should the cross-fertilization go? And, uh, and this, I think, should lead us also to be thinking about, but 
who are doing this list of the people sitting on this and how are they selected? And shouldn't the states also involve other, other, other sections, components of, uh, of the countries in the selection of the judges and so on? So all this is food for thought, but it seems to me that we are at a turning point in terms of the sociology of the people sitting in, on courts and tribunals. Thank you. Robert. Uh, yes, I'd like to take up um, uh, Laurence's invitation to... Uh, to jump in on, on some of this. But first of all, it's a great uh, pleasure and honor uh, to be here at this wonderful occasion. I've known Ellen for uh, about a decade, uh, the preeminent scholar in WTO law, but also she's emerged as a leader in legal education and someone who's reflected most deeply on the role of jurists in, in, in public life. And I can't think of anyone uh, better to um, to lead this extremely promising uh, project and initiative. And so congratulations uh, to Ilan and also congratulations to Max Planck on this, uh, on this wonderful choice. Um, so in fact, in WTO law, uh, or WTO as an institution, there are two cultures of um, adjudication. And that alone makes the WTO system quite interesting. So there's the culture of adjudication at the level of the panels, which are uh, extensively uh, staffed with uh, former uh, diplomats or sitting diplomats on secondment, government officials, and so on, many of whom are amateurs, non-lawyers, and, uh, and have uh, very uh, insider and technocratic perceptions of legal and policy issues and in the WTO, and just to relate this uh, panel to the first one, to give you an example of uh, the amateur nature uh, of uh, a panel level adjudication, I was recently attended a hearing in Geneva in the Seal Products case where the chair of the panel uh, made the statement that a panel, uh, a WTO panel, has no authority to, uh, uh, to uh, consider uh, its own jurisdiction. And in fact, in one of the, it was established right from the beginning of WTO jurisprudence, even from the Bananas case, that not only does a panel have the authority to determine its jurisdiction, it has an obligation to assure that it has proper uh, jurisdiction. So, I mean, uh, frankly, if, if a student had put this uh, on an exam, they would have been very lucky to get a passing grade in my introductory course in, in WTO law. So that gives you a sense of the one culture uh, of adjudication. The other culture of adjudication is that represented by the appellate body. And I recently had occasion to look at um, the biographies of uh, the appellate body uh, members. And uh, one of uh, my WTO law colleagues, who actually teaches in Geneva, Jos Powell, uh, recently argued that actually um, the appellate body has the same, essentially the same kind of composition as the panels. But, but in fact, with respect to Yost, uh, due respect to Yost, it's not true. If you look at the, the biographies of the appellate body members, most of them have either been professors, judges, have been exposed uh, at, a, at a very high level to domestic legal systems and so on. And this has created, I think, a very, very different, uh, a very different uh, culture and has created a situation where the appellate body has has uh, really uh, had to overturn a, a, an enormous number of findings uh, of, um, uh, of, of panels um, and uh, working within an extremely tight time frame and very limited uh, resources. Uh, some, such as the EU, prefer, and I agree with this, the professionalization of the panel process. But the appellate body has performed this particular role. Uh, and especially uh, significant is the fact that in cases which I would regard as high-profile cases where other values are at stake, and not just uh, trade liberalization, but um, uh, the protection of natural resources, the environment, animal welfare, uh, public health, 
uh, it's almost always been the case that the appellate body has adjusted in some way uh, the the panel reports in the in the kind of in the favor of greater policy space or greater um, uh, sensitivity or deference to what one might call non uh, trade uh, uh, values. I think this is um, uh, a phenomenon that's becoming somewhat less the case, but it was certainly a very uh, uh, a pronounced um, feature of this, uh, what I call two cultures of adjudication that existed uh, within, uh, within a single um, uh, institution. Um, you know, finally, um, the, the WTO uh, has uh, been characterized uh, as lacking in political dynamism. It's not a, a dynamic system. All of us know that, uh, you know, the attempt to conclude another round of negotiations has been very fraught. There's been some progress. We now have a trade facilitation agreement. But a, 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 a judiciary like the appellate body um, has a different position in a legal system that is kind of stuck uh, as opposed to one that is very dynamic politically uh, and, uh, and diplomatically. And there's a sense in which the appellate body has had to fill gaps and play a role of judicial statecraft that um, uh, uh, unusually often, by virtue of the fact that there are very few ways of uh, adjusting the system politically and diplomatically, uh, primarily because of the consensus rule in relation to the extreme diversity of WTO membership that exists today. That rule was inherited from the GATT when there were four or five major powers that basically dominated the decision-making process in the GATT and has been very hard to operate in this new uh, environment with the BRICS and new powers that feel that they have a real stake in the, uh, in the system. In talking to the d members of the WTO appellate body, which I do from time to time, and I've had the great privilege to know some of them even as friends, uh, I get the sense that they have reluctantly taken on this role, that they don't necessarily like or feel comfortable with the idea that they have this task, in a way, of substituting for political and diplomatic evolution uh, of the system. And I would compare that to my occasional uh, contacts with U.S. Supreme Court justices who are very well aware that the United States Constitution is not likely to change very often. Uh, 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 and, uh, and so, uh, who, but who feel very confident uh, of their legitimacy to... Um, to have the primary responsibility for evolving a constitutional order uh, that is unlikely uh, to change very much through explicit, um, explicit uh, constitutional amendment. And I think that contrast uh, of confidence in one's legitimacy versus a sense of many of the appellate body members that I've spoken to uh, that, you know, of reluctance to play such a, 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 you know, a role of statecraft, although I think they're doing it actually very well, uh, is something to reflect on. Uh, before giving the floor to, to Judge Bonisho, I would just, what Robert said just made me uh, think that uh, at the outset, the WTO system uh, binds the, the best of two worlds because in, in the panel, in giving a, also a, uh, an answer to what uh, Laurence uh, uh, raised, the, the issue of the uh, sociological basis of, of, the, of, of the panels of the judges. So the WTO appears as binding the best of the two worlds. On one side of the panels you have uh, not necessarily not only lawyers, you have economists, you have uh, specialists in many different fields, but not necessarily lawyers. And then the appellate body, you have this more settled uh, and, uh, let's say, so more knowledgeable uh, body of, uh, of, uh, of lawyers. But then it has not only has advantages, it has also, as we have seen, disadvantages, as you, uh, as you show. And, uh, and one of those is uh, the tendency by the panels to, to bring as many arguments uh, as they can, because possi possibly because they, are not, they do not feel really sure about uh, the technicalities or, or on many different uh, arguments uh, raised by, by the parties. 
And so this uh, gives then more work to the appellate body to, to find out and uh, the arguments which were really uh, important, which were crucial. So all the other way around, the, the panel doesn't really make this uh, job in brackets uh, properly. And so the appellate body then is obliged to complete the analysis, what it often does. So it's a uh, from the outside, because I'm not a specialist of WTO law, but I have this impression that these uh, two, uh, two um, as, you, as you said, these two notions, different notions of adjudications, adjudication in practice doesn't really work uh, as at best. So I, I wonder if it uh, would be a, a model to to take up and to and to. Um, a, practice some in some other courts. So that was just uh, an idea from what I, my own idea was about the way it, uh, uh, the judiciary body works in WTO, and it was, uh, so to say, uh, uh, confirmed by, by, by your insight. But uh, Judge Bonisho. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, first, I apologize for my little having been a bit late, uh, and I uh, I thank uh, very much uh, Hélène for in having invited me here. We are got to know each other for years, years ago, and uh, I'm very happy each time to, to participate in this kind of, uh, of round table in which we can uh, speak directly and from very, of, uh, about very concrete, uh, concrete items. Uh, when you want to speak, when one speaks about uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union uh, in the context of, uh, of, uh, of international law and litigation, you know, uh, there is in French an expression, uh, we say, on est assis entre deux chaises, you are sitting between two chairs. And we are sitting between two chairs because uh, uh, from the outside, uh, the ECJ is often seen and described as an international court. But in fact, it's true that to some extent it is an international court. But in reality, uh, the Court of Justice is very close to a constitutional court of the member states or to uh, the Supreme Court of the member states. Uh, and when you want to uh, appreciate uh, the way in which uh, it functions, in which it operates, you have to come back to the true functions of the court, which are quite different from the functions of international courts. You spoke just about criminal court, very specific, uh, ICJ, very broad competence, international law. Uh, our position is very different. We have three functions, and that is completely decisive for the way in which we, 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 we work. First, we ensure the, that in the functioning of the union, the law should be respected. That is to ensure the respect of what we call uh, usually the principle of legality. Principle of legality for the institution of the, of the Union. Council, Parliament, Commission, other bodies, agency, and so on. That's one, one task, which is, and you see it immediately, very comparable to the task of an administrative court or a constitutional court of a member state. Second task, action of failure. Ensure that the member states respect union law. And you just spoke about the Supreme Court of uh, the United States. We have here a task, a function, a power. Uh, that uh, 
is not in the competence, for example, of the Supreme Court of the US, which is usually seen as the most powerful court in the world. We can sentence a state and have, we can fine a state for millions, for hundreds of millions. That's a very big power. And last but not least, and perhaps it is the first task, we have to ensure the unity of application, unity of application of union law. And that is a task which is very comparable to the fundamental task of the uh, court of the Supreme Court of the US. And I, I remember having spoken with uh, the justices of uh, the Supreme Court and uh, I heard, for example, Justice Breyer saying, uh, our task is not to judge, is not to reappreciate what one court or the other has done. Our task is to ensure unity of application of federal law. We are exactly in the same position. So uh, that's the first, the first uh, element which has to be taken into consideration. And then I come back to uh, what has already been said uh, about the spirit in which a body works. And you said, uh, I am completely fully agree, that every body and every judicial body, body develops the reasonings, the way of working, which, is, which are in keeping with the system in which it lives and in the system in which it has to work. And I come back to the second point, and you cut me if I am too long. Uh, one very, very important element, which is often left aside when you look at the European Court of Justice, is following. Contrary to some courts, and especially the Court of Human Rights, our task is not only to apply general principles of law, for example, the 13, 14, with the protocols, 20 principles, which are enshrined in the Convention of Human Rights and in the protocols. We are applying daily, daily, thousands of pieces of law, regulations, directives, decisions, and so on and so on. And to this extent, from this aspect, we are in a very, very comparable situation with, uh, to, to, to the situation of, for example, the Cour de Cassation of Belgium or the Cour de Cassation of France. We don't apply general principles, we are applying a legislation. And we are applying a legislation, above all, with a rule of procedure, which is a very strict one, and which is, I would, would say, say, a very continental one. What is the spirit in which we, we are working? You spoke at the outset, at the beginning, your introduction, Professor, about judicial activism. One court has often been accused of and even sentenced for judicial activism. It's our court. It's our court. Is it true, to some extent, perhaps, but, but don't forget that we have to apply a treaty and a set of treaties, a set of treaties, which first have a spirit and second have a wording. Spirit is completely clear when you look, for example, at the preamble of the treaties, which have never been changed from the beginning. Now, we are speaking, for example, in the United Kingdom, uh, in the perspective of the referendum, in 2016 or 2017, one never <coughs> knows until now, about 
the ever closer union of the people of Europe, which is clearly set enshrined in the treaties from the beginning. So that is something, one element of the, one fundamental element of the interpretation of the treaty. And I often say to the students, when the members change the formula and say the treaties have as goal an ever less closer union between the people of Europe, then we will change our car's law and adapt <laughs> to, the new, to the, new, the new goal of the European Union. Wording. Contrary to what is often said, when you look at the treaties, a good deal of the provisions are very clear. Some of them are matter of interpretation, of construction. That's without consultation possible. But a good deal, the greater part of the provisions are very clear. And so are the vast majority of the provisions, of the regulations, of the directives, and so on. So I stop there, and if you agree, I will come back later to the um, concrete way in which we, 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 we work and uh, come back to the po so composition of the court because composition is very well known, domestic judges, which, which uh, I just uh, want to, uh, would like to highlight this point with requirement, a requirement which is from the beginning, from the outset, very clear in the treaty, uh, in order to be appointed to the court as well as to the tribunal, you must have the capacity of being nominated in the highest jurisdiction, highest court of your member state, or being a lawyer, a jurist, very notorious. So it's very, very clear and shined in the, in the, in the treaty. Thank you, Judge Bonichot. And after having heard Judge Poker, I was thinking if we can really compare international courts and tribunals and international criminal courts. And now, after having heard you, even more, the question raises, may we, and in which, how far may we compare international courts and tribunals and the ECJ? And I think, well, because of the uniqueness of the legal system you are interpreting and applying, but still there is this, I think there is some purpose, there is some reason in uh, keeping your court in, in the broader picture we have, because you represent in a way a, a, a goal which is uh, unreachable by now, until, until now and still, uh, by international law standards. So there is uh, some paradox uh, that uh, one of your main functions, the preliminary ruling function, which is, is a guarantee, is really the fundamental, the, the cornerstone for the unity of application of, of a law is, is seen sometimes, every time and now, is, is um, proposed as a solution also for other international courts, uh, courts and, and tribunals, even for the ICJ. And so it's, uh, it gives you much uh, food for thought to, to see how different your court is from others, but still how some of the solutions of the European Court of, of Justice could be mutatis mutandis taken up by, by other courts. Before going to the second chapter of, of, our, of our round table, Just yes. Word, preliminary ruling would be the dream of the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, yeah, that was just an example I was uh, thinking about. So before going to the second chapter of our round table, just to uh, ask uh, our speakers if they want to, to say something more on this. Uh, Fausto and Rüdiger. I, I, I want to, yeah. uh, just, just shortly to take up uh, the last question you have uh, taken up again after my in previous intervention. Should we try to keep the system uh, in a way as a harmonic system when there are international courts or should we 
say we cannot apply the same standards, uh, they are completely, completely different. Um, I tend to say I will not speak for the Court of Justice of the EU, although I tend to put it in the international system nevertheless. Uh, but for the criminal courts, I think that at the end uh, uh, they belong to the international system exactly as the other courts. The fact that uh, procedures are different and ways of establishing an international legal order may be different. Each court contributes with different means, with different uh, capacities, with different uh, uh, procedures. But uh, at the end, uh, the goal is the same. I mean, take uh, the International Criminal Court, which is their goal? To prevent and to, of course, uh, also repress serious violation of human rights is exactly the same goal as the human rights courts, to see to it that uh, violations do not occur. And uh, those who occurred are repaired. Whether this is done in, with a criminal procedure or with a different procedure imposing on the state a reparation, it's, it's a different uh, way of dealing with the matter, but uh, the, the goal is exactly the same. The, and I would add also that uh, um, it's true the state is not involved as such, but if you look at the political role of international criminal courts, it involves the states. Because uh, when we deal with war crimes, who commits war crimes? The military of the states. So the message goes to the states as well. It's not just to the, to the person that committed the crime. It's not just only a repressive jurisdiction, but a jurisdiction that tends to go to those who may be at the origin of the violation or has to supervise, monitor that crimes do not, uh, uh, do not occur, the violation of human rights do not occur. So in a way, uh, there is a similarity with human rights courts. I, moving from a human rights jurisdiction or quasi jurisdiction to the criminal court, I didn't see much uh, difference myself in the role I had in uh, of my action in what i in what i did but all of them in a way or another but this applies to the other courts as well to the wto is that tend to establish an international legal order that may uh, may be viable uh, thank you andrea i fully share the views of Faustus. And I would really warn, I take it more or less diplomatically, I want to separate the International Criminal Court or the European Court of Justice from international courts as such. For the following reasons, I don't repeat what you have said, I agree to that. There are additional reasons. First of all, the judges come more or less from the same pool. Uh, if you look into see how judges are selected, what's their background, uh, they are not identical, but similar. Secondly, what is very evident, counsel. Counsel appears before ICC, ICJ, European Court of Justice alike. There's occasionally the same persons. And thirdly, when it comes to training, look around. These young people, which are under the responsibility of Elaine and Burkhardt, they want to become counsel or perhaps one day judges. If you specialize them too early, you limit their chances in professionalism. Uh, therefore, <laughs> uh, my strong advocacy is keep everything together and learn from the differences and not overemphasize the differences. I fully share your view and I found it very enlightening what you said. Sure, you have to cope with a permanently growing, like in a jungle of legal norms. Yeah. Therefore, your function in the European Court of Justice is to keep, to a certain extent, some order in the catastrophe <laughs> or chaos. For us, uh, in the more general international courts, we do it differently. We work on the basic of principles. We develop the jurisprudence, 
And somehow, again, we are, then it's the same situation you have. We have a lot of jurisprudence which has to be coordinated. Only it's self-made, and for you it's foreign-made. But apart from that, the problem we are facing is the same. Your example you gave with the American Supreme Court is telling. Sure, you as the Supreme Court is stepping in for the Constitution making which has not, never been done. Uh, the same is for us. It's different for the European Court of Justice. Nevertheless, a function we are having is, one, solving a dispute. Secondly, to work for, yes, uh, uh, let's put it dramatically, peace, applying the rule of law, that's all identical, and keeping the legal system more or less uh, coherent. These are the functions we are all having, and in this respect, we are very similar. Thank you. Thank you, Rudiger, because you also made possible to, uh, the, to move from the first uh, cluster to the second one, and I said uh, adjudication versus arbitration in how far procedural rules, substantive rules, uh, play a role in, uh, in, in shaping this difference. But I don't know if Laurence wants to, to yeah. intervene on the I first or already on the second part. No, uh, I wanted part. To, uh, to react and ask something to Rudiger. I was taken by this uh, distinction that Judge Bonichou made between applying legislation versus applying general principles. So the international courts would be applying general principles only. And I was listening then to Rudiger, and uh, I was thinking, but it's not only, because think about the, f the first advisory opinion of the chamber uh, uh, of the high seas in the, uh, in the, of, the, of ITLOS. When you look at the technicalities of the regulations that had to be interpreted, there we were very much in applying legislation. And then I was thinking of Gabriel and Robert, and the, 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 at WTO, it's not just general principles, it's much more. So I'm not so sure that this is the distinction that we should be drawing between you know, the European the court of Luxembourg vis-à-vis uh, -vis the other courts, because it seems to me that this is a big change with international law. It has grown. It has become much more specific, and we, that's, I think, why we need also very good technicians of international law. Yeah. Thank you, Laurence. So to the second uh, chapter of our roundtable, who wants to take the floor first? Rudiger. I, your question was, do procedural rules encourage, let's put uh, not the word activism, but progressive development? And my answer is clearly no. Uh, I could stop at that, but I will explain it. Uh, one has to distinguish between procedural rules, which I will address, and the rules of substance. In the moment, the situation is that a court or tr a tribunal, I'm speaking also for arbitration, can only, or will only, use arguments which have been voiced by the parties. Uh, it is considered to be bad style to pick up an argument which has never been addressed. And there may be even more behind that. It's not only a question of bad style. Now compare the situation where we have the two parties and compare, please, there is the situation where we only have one party, namely in the Arctic Sunrise case where Russia is not participating or in the South China Sea case where China is not participating. According to the rules of procedure applying in both cases, it is now for the court to develop the arguments of the non-appearing party. If you compare, and you can easily do it, I'm only quoting from official sources, what Russia has said relatedly and what China has said in its statement from November last year, then you see that the tribunal or the court went far beyond what these two states have said, using the non-appearance rules. What I want to say is, uh, what we are not aware of, at least so far, that the parties are very often not fully arguing their cases for different purposes. Maybe the purpose they don't want to prejudge another case. They don't want to introduce an argument somebody else might use in a different case. One reason why the 
the border, border uh, case on the delimitation between the Netherlands and Germany never came to court that the Netherlands would have to use an argument which would be detrimental vis-a-vis -vis Belgium. And there are various other reasons, for example, it, internal reasons. Therefore, uh, we would need uh, to really make international courts and tribunal uh, to bring them into a position to use arguments which are in the interest of, of the community at large, let's say, climate change, human rights, things like that. We need either more liberalization in respect of intervention, amicus curia, or an advocate general, or to be much more lenient in respect of that a statesman bringing a case don't have only to bring their own interests. Let me give you an explanation. In the moment, if a coastal state extends a continental shelf beyond 200 nautical miles, encroaching upon the sacred uh, deep seabed areas, the so-called area, common heritage. Under the present system, no claim can be brought against that state. The seabed authority has no standing. The neighboring states, if their rights are not infringed upon, they have no possibility to bring that case. The only possibility exists to argue, I wanted to do mining in particularly that area under Part 11, and I can't, which is an emergency exit uh, situation and not very safe. Here, the uh, tribunal would have to take, yes, go at great lengths to look into that matter. Practically, it's barred from doing so. It could be done in an advisory opinion. There's a situation that's different. In a contentious case, I would argue, are ill-suited, you heard that all yesterday, uh, ill-suited to, to deal with community interests. And I, in this respect, I see the major deficiency for the present dispute settlement system. All right, thank you, uh, Rudiger, and um, for the wealth of, of ideas, notions, concepts you have uh, in such a short time um, presented. But I was wondering, as you said, uh, it would be a matter of bad taste for a for an international court to uh, to raise uh, proprio motu questions which were not uh, raised in the arguments by the parties. You used, uh, let's say, an, a technical notion of b bad taste. That means it's just a matter of opportunity and a matter of discretion, or is a matter really of, of law? Because I think it uh, could be. That's, uh, is that what normally courts uh, do or do not? But if you think about the nuclear test case, I mean, uh, the fundamental principle is uh, you run off with Korea. And so even if the parties didn't think about the International Court of Justice solved uh, a ve a very touchy um, issues by just uh, saying, oh, well, unilateral acts of states and promise and, uh, and inherent, uh, inherent jurisdiction for the court to do that, inherent powers of the court to, to do that. And so you see, it's a really a difficult, a very subtle uh, a point, this one of what, could, what court may do or may not do or would be opportune to do or not to do. But, well, if we had to answer directly, I'm grateful for that. Uh, apart from that, this court would be uh, accused of very uh, strong activism. It's not the same, even if the court would do that. It's not the same for where does this information come from? From inside the court, private knowledge, and it is neither transparent, uh, and particularly it's not really brought to the court in a transparent manner. For me, it makes a difference whether the information about, let's say, consequences of climate change are brought in a properly channeled to the court, or if some of the more activistic, uh, activist uh, judges brings up the issue internally where you don't know where it comes from. It has some consequences. If you leave that to the court, then the court will be flooded individually by interest groups which is not in the interest of independent decision-making. Yeah, Therefore, crazy. I want to provide proper channeling. And these uh, ideas, methods, facts, information to the court, uh, I mean to all judges. 
But it's, isn't it a matter then, Probably. yes, of, of due process largely that, um, you know, that for example, the, the parties have an opportunity um, to, um, to respond uh, to uh, these arguments or this information. So that might mean they would need, need to recall an expert. That might mean that they would need to submit some uh, additional short pleading responding to the argument. But if you have these procedural uh, protections, uh, myself, I don't think there's anything uh, out of line about, uh, about the tribunal uh, raising uh, arguments and, and considerations uh, that, um, that haven't been uh, brought into the record by, by the parties. I, I really just think it's a, you know, a due process issue. Fausto? Well, I was uh, just <laughs> I was thinking on this, on, this, uh, on this last point, actually. Um, the criminal court may be in a specific situation yes. because uh, at the basis of a criminal case there is a, an indictment. An indictment is drafted by a prosecutor, uh, is brought like that to the court, cannot be changed by the court. Uh, according uh, uh, to the, generally an indictment, uh, motu proprio cannot be changed by the court. Uh, and uh, the court is necessarily bound by what is in the indictment, even if the indictment is defective. Yeah. So may come to the, at the end uh, to an acquittal simply based uh, uh, on the defect in the indictment. For instance, because the indictment is pleading the wrong uh, mode of responsibility. We, and uh, this cannot be proved later. Had uh, the indictment been drafted differently, it could be changed. But of course, the, the, the prosecutor can, during the trial, ask, a move for a change in indictment, and the court can give it. Yes, sure. But if the prosecutor does not do it, it's not the court that can suggest it, because yeah. it will be, uh, we take away something from the, from the independence and impartiality yeah. of the court. It will be an intrusion yes. in, in, in the case. Um, the, the case has happened several times. Uh, prosecutors tend to insist, because it's a general principle, on the responsibility of superiors over, for acts committed by subordinates. But this uh, requires strict rules in the sense that the, the prosecutor, the superior, must have effective control over the subordinate. Otherwise, he cannot be uh, deemed responsible for the activity. And the effect of control is not easy to, to prove, technically. If one had used uh, a symbol of aiding and abetting, it would have been much easier. The case would have been much easier. And many cases have been lost on that, simply. Yes. On, on, but that's what, only to say that uh, uh, there is a limit uh, to intrude in what... Uh, the parties yes. uh, are bringing in a, in a criminal case. But that's just to, to answer this point. I don't know if we have to take other, yeah, other no, well, issues. The, the, the questions are many and uh, quite broad. Uh, but of course, this perspective of uh, criminal uh, justice is once again very peculiar. Because yeah, again, but it's, uh, can I answer that immediately? Yes, <laughs> so <laughs> I answered before uh, to your first uh, 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 attempt to make it very peculiar, but uh, uh, well, each, each system has the rules, I mean, uh, of what you can bring in by the judges or, or not. But on the other question that has been raised, uh, that's more important, is the sources of law. Uh, the use of the sources of law principles, legislation, uh, I agree that it's a combination, of course. In any case, it's a combination, but perhaps the criminal courts are those who uh, have made more use of principles than any other international court. Because uh, it seems uh, strange, but, uh, uh, and that goes against what happens in states normally, when uh, criminal law has acts of legislation. In international law, there is uh, little legislation little legislation. There is no, uh, no 
general legislation in this in these matters, and even the Geneva Convention or so has only partial legislation of the matter. So you have to invent or introduce principles of law. Yeah. Maybe that can be brought to the uh, using Article 38 of the Statute of the ICJ to the general principles of law more than to customary law, or to what extent it goes to customary law, what to the principle can be discussed and would require an analysis. Somebody may do it. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yes, I, I thank you, uh, Fausto, because this brings uh, me back to, to my question, which, exactly. which was... Uh, uh, which uh, uh, margin of, of discretion do international courts have to uh, develop uh, international custom to, to change uh, jurisprudence, reversal of jurisprudence, which are the, the margin uh, which uh, individual judges uh, enjoy in doing that or the, 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 the bench in its, uh, as a whole. So, L L Laurence, do you want to, to, to intervene on I this? have another topic that you had addressed. <laughs> yes, I don't know. We really have too, too little time. <laughs> yes, of course. But Judge Bonichot just, wants to yes, just to intervene on, on this. this. Uh, very quickly on, on this point. Uh, we at the ECJ, we have a, a rather, a rather uh, precise framework. And uh, you have to distinguish between the type of actions. Uh, action for annulment, uh, the... Uh, uh, the one who wants to, 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 to obtain the annulment of, a, of an act has to, 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 to bring a plea of law and uh, we have to, to, to answer on this plea of law and we cannot go and draw another plea except the case of what we, we call moyen d'ordre public. Uh, very, very important, for example, motivations. Uh, we, we, we can, we can take, take it... Uh, out of the file on our own. For action of failure, uh, the Commission has to prove. And if he doesn't prove the Commission, it loses his case. But for preliminary ruling, we have a long line case law uh, according to which uh, we are asked questions, for example, about this directive about, or about this provision of this directive. But the court can, in order to, as we say, help as much as possible the, the referring judge for his case, we can uh, answer on another ground. For example, add the interpretation of another directive that we uh, consider as being possibly of application in the case before the, the referring judge. And that has uh, risen some question because uh, uh, some courts, now it's over, but some courts, uh, for example, my, our Conseil d'État in France, said, yes, we asked the court of one point, and you answer on this point, but on another point too, uh, you are bound uh, on, on the first point, but uh, what we, you have said, you court on the other point, we are, it's not binding on for us, you know. But now the Conseil d'État has changed his, uh, his case law, and generally uh, all courts in all member states uh, agree with our, our, our way of, uh, of, of doing. So in the case of preliminary ruling, we have this margin of uh, 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 going a bit farther, a bit beyond uh, the precise question of the, of the referring judge. And that's something very interesting because you see, uh, you know, from the outside, uh, you may consider that preliminary ruling is something very abstract. You are asked about the interpretation of one point of an article of law and you say in uh, abstract term what this means, what, in what, which way it has to be, it has to be co construed. But in fact, in fact, uh, the reality <laughs> leads you to go a bit farther uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the case and in the concrete case uh, pending before the, the national judge. But I, would, I would just, um, yes. on this Robert, exact uh, point, um, or uh, in the spirit of this, um, of this, of this question, um, it, se it seems to me that w you know, it's a matter of choice as to whether parties want to uh, regulate their relations according to 
uh, international law. International law is only one device for uh, ordering relations between different, uh, different parties, but given that they've chosen that they be regulated by international law, I think they inherently bring in a very rich normative universe that's in principle unrestricted in the sense that it's only restricted by being the universe of international law. And in a way, this is something I get out of uh, Bruno's um, opinion in oil platforms, that the, the background is always, is always there, just as when parties enter into a contract, they suppose that the, there are all these default rules about what a contract means. Um, and, and so I become very frustrated by the tendency of many arbitrators and, and judges to try and arbitrarily narrow uh, this, uh, this nor rich normative universe. Mm -hmm. I say arbitrarily because usually the, uh, the, uh, the applicable treaty or compromissory clause doesn't in itself necessarily uh, narrow it. But I, I admit that there are different views even within my own faculty on this, and I sometimes argue with, say, uh, Jose Alvarez, who has, a, I think, a more narrow or stricter approach to what, uh, what adjudicators are supposed to do. But my view is it has to be, it has to be broader. We have to, uh, to make the most use of this broad and rich universe that's been acquired and evolved uh, uh, w uh, with such difficulty often over, over the last uh, decades. Uh, thank you, Robert, for, for your intervention, especially for your mentioning the oil platform case. Because I think that was a, a very good example how the court uh, used uh, procedural means in order to, uh, to express his, uh, his judicial policy. Uh, they, they, the pleadings were held at the time where the USA was um, invading Iraq, and at the same time uh, the US uh, was uh, defending itself before the International Court of mm -hmm. Justice with these exceptions of self-defense uh, for his uh, um, bombing, for having bombed uh, the, the Iranian oil platforms. And so I think that was, that's a very interesting uh, example of how the International Court want to say something on the issue of uh, use of force, self-defense, the limits of self-defense and uh, permitted use of force. And, and in huge obit obiter dictum, he uh, went on pages and pages in, in, um, in, in, in dealing with, the, with this aspect, which was uh, technically was, uh, was not even into his jurisdiction, which was based only on the very narrow basis of Article 10 of, of, the, of the bilateral friendship treaty between the US and Iran of 55. So you see, back to my first question, how procedural rules or substantive rules uh, permits uh, a court to develop uh, its own uh, judicial policy? But, uh, well, uh, Lawrence, I don't know if you had uh, an answer on this or a different subject <laughs> but which pertains to, to this uh, broad uh, cluster of uh, it's judicial policy. It's the policy. third question and the last. No. <laughs> uh, what, what, excuse me, do you so, want to? Uh, no, but when you presented the questions, you say that who are the judges and uh, what are they for and how the others are looking at them yeah. and so on. Okay. And something that I have, you know, on my mind and uh, maybe also looking now quite closely to the investment world is that uh, there is something which is striking. There is a presumption of conflict of interest, which is attached, a growing presumption that people in this world are not really behaving well, that there is something to be regulated and so on. And uh, if you look at the last uh, EU proposal uh, about uh, this investment court, as I call it, uh, there is an annex which is really stipulating the fact that conflict of interest should be regulated and so on. So that's the point. Now, uh, if you look at uh, how courts and tribunals, I, th I think that we should take this seriously. We should take this seriously because it means that the people are looking at the courts and tribunals, and they, I think, that's my viewpoint, that courts and tribunals are also delivering public goods, that's for sure. We, and, uh, and they are playing a public function, uh, which is very important. So um, with this publicness issue, I think there are ethics is linked to that. And that 
and then I come to ethics, and I think that this is going to be a very important issue. Uh, and when you look at the way courts and tribunals have reacted to this issue, it's interesting to see that uh, the criminal courts, I think they have looked at the national practice and so on. The International Court of Justice has uh, adopted this uh, directive or direction, I don't know how you say that in English, which is uh, often mentioned, but otherwise there is not much. And why is it that courts and tribunals and the, and the people from these, uh, and the councils and the, and the experts and the, the people who are actors in this field are sort of re reluctant to codify practices? Uh, uh, I've heard by a well-known um, counsel before the court that we don't need, uh, we don't need these rules, we know them, and you're obsessed with codification, and this is a Napoleonic attitude. And I just thought, no, it's not. It's not. There is a need for certainty, there is a need for benchmarks. So that's the question I want to put on this table is that, isn't it that procedure should also be doing, dealing with eth ethical rules? Uh, I think that's absolutely right. And, and uh, there is, however, a certain kind of proceduralism that I think has poisoned uh, investor state uh, arbitration because um, uh, Bruno's view of procedure is not the typical one of um, uh, of arbitrators in these um, in these cases, and um, it, it's possible for parties to uh, engage in multi-million-dollar uh, procedural wrangling before substantive issues ever get decided, and that's really only possible because uh, I think you don't have. I was talking uh, at lunch with, with Gabrielle and others about this. You don't really have a standing body that would probably dismiss in 15 minutes uh, uh, procedural uh, maneuvers that sometimes waste months and months in investor state arbitration. And so I'm very encouraged by the uh, EU proposal, and I recently actually heard uh, DG Trade in New York mention that uh, the Commission is also not just interested in this in the TTIP context, but perhaps creating a multilateral court uh, for investor state arbitration that would eventually, through a web of bilateral agreements, uh, uh, replace the current uh, practices. And if you look at the, the scholarly literature and the jurisprudence, you have so much uh, written on procedure that conceals a real poverty of analysis of substantive norms. Take the norm of fair and equitable treatment. Um, you know, I'm very familiar with the U.S. and Canadian constitutional jurisprudence on due process, and, and, and many of you will be familiar with that jurisprudence in your own systems. It's very rich. The secondary literature is very rich. If you look at the jurisprudence of the secondary literature in investor state arbitration, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, it's really pitiful in comparison to the, the jurisprudence and, 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 and legal theory of due process in, in, many, in many other, uh, other contexts. And, and so this also, I think, would be addressed by having a different kind of rule of law culture, perhaps in a court, rather than the investor state arbitration system. Well, I have been uh, reminded by, by Elaine that we don't have so much time anymore if we want to have to also to have a, a discussion. So I... I ask uh, the participants if they wanted to say something, uh, last remark before, before uh, giving uh, the floor to the audience. Uh, please, uh, Dr. Bonichon. One word about the, uh, the possibility of the judge of uh, um, uh, what are, are, are the powers of the judge uh, uh, in front of a case. Uh, uh, there, there is a problem of the police. Uh, if you can take out from the file one other plea. But there is another aspect which is very, very important. It is the, I would say, the intensity, the extent in which the judge can review, for example, an act which, is, uh, which has been uh, contested uh, uh, by, uh, by a party. And in the case law of the Court of Justice, there has been a, a very important evolution which is following. Uh, there was a, there is still a settled case law, long line case law, which is that uh, when the institutions take an act, for example, a regulation directive, and uh, base uh, this act on appreciation, 
political, sociological, economical appreciation, and so on, uh, they have a very large margin of appreciation. And then, counterpart, the, the, the control of the judge is, I would say, limited. But, and that's something in some ex to some extent new, when fundamental rights are at stake, are at stake then the, re the power of you reviewing the control of the judge has to be strict. And it was said uh, expressly in the digital rights case about the, about the retention of data, and it has been confirmed a few, a few days ago in the Schrems case, mm -hmm. uh, already very, uh, very well known about the uh, conditions of transferring data from Europe to, to the, the US. And uh, in this case, uh, also in this case, the CGIS said that where fundamental rights here, private, privacy and so on, are at stake, the judge has to, uh, uh, to, uh, to put in, uh, uh, to, 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 uh, uh, to apply a very strict, very strict control and so to reduce the margin of appreciation of the institutions. And something yeah. which is very important, I think. But so that's because it becomes a matter of law, more than discretion. Exactly. So I thank you, Judge Bonichot, because you helped us to, to come also, even if you know, short of time, to this last uh, chapter of, of my question uh, list. It means ah. who is the company, uh, who are the company of, of judges, uh, which views are taken into consideration by judges before taking a decision, uh, so the parties, but the third states, uh, civil society, and so you made a point, Laurence, about the publicness of the, of the proceedings. You made a point about the, the difference of the, the, the rights which are at stake. Uh, which is your view, uh, Rudiger or Faust or Robert, on this? How much, how, uh, how far should uh, international courts or, and tribunals take into account the, uh, the environment uh, around their decisions? Uh, if I may, uh, apart from the procedural misgivings I'm having, uh, and I'm uh, on the basis of the Law of the Sea Convention, uh, all the issues can be taken into, uh, into account, uh, issued by the civil society, the General Assembly, or international organization. Actually, we have done so in advisory opinions of the standards set by the Law of the Sea Convention are extremely flexible as what I always refer to as blanket norms which not can be filled, which are waiting to be filled and in this respect judges have the possibility, apart from my criticism of the procedural side, to really endorse uh, the substantive law under which we are working. Uh, well, there are, of course, uh, limits in, in what you can do, but uh, uh, if I consider a criminal courts, um, in the statutes of criminal courts, uh, you have to remain within the framework of, of your Separate. statute, of course, in exercise jurisdiction, uh, but which are the goals for which a court is established? And here you find a... a, a a series of goals that are not strictly judicial. The first uh, is to bring uh, perpetrators to justice, and that's clearly a judicial policy that can be expressed. But you have reconciliation purposes in countries torn by, by events uh, that, that's expressly written in the statute of, uh, of uh, the Tribunal for Rwanda, the Tribunal for the Former Yugoslavia. You have uh, the, the maintenance of peace, even. Whether the Security Council inserts the maintenance of peace to justify its, uh, its legitimacy to, uh, to set up a, a court may be, may be something, in, in, of course, because otherwise the Security Council be, may not have the power to, do, to intervene. But uh, uh, in terms of interpretation, if you use this uh, chapeau, 
uh, preambular elements, you can go very far. And the ICTY has gone extremely far in developing customary law. Uh, enough to say, I can't go into details because we are at the end of the, of the, of the recording on this, but uh, um, uh, in, the, in customary international law, there was uh, essentially nothing on uh, uh, serious violations of the laws of war in non-international armed conflicts. But through the interpretation in the seminal Tadic decision, the, the ICTY has come to apply the regime of the great breaches to, uh, of the Geneva Conventions to, uh, to non-international armed conflicts, not only, but also to widen the same system of the grave breaches in international armed conflict. At the point that, for instance, gender crimes did not exist in the Geneva Conventions and have become absolutely part of customary law. Now, nobody would dispute now that this, this is part of customary law. So the, the law has changed uh, dramatically uh, against the practice of states because the states, when the additional protocols in 77 were adopted, the Geneva Conventions, expressly opposed the extension of the regime of grave breaches on non-international conflicts. So the margin is quite, quite, quite wide. Yeah. Uh, Robert, do you want to say something on, on this point? Very, very, very quickly. The uh, at, the, at the WTO, um, the, the appellate body has interpreted its uh, inherent... Uh, uh, power as a judiciary to, and, and also in the case of the first instance, the panels interpreted a provision of the dispute settlement understanding uh, uh, such that uh, amicus briefs are admissible in WTO disputes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, with respect to the facts, um, you know, NGO submissions uh, have uh, been on occasion important uh, but rarely with respect uh, to the law. And one, the most remarkable example to my mind is in the seal products uh, case uh, where mm -hmm. Canada and Norway were challenging the EU uh, seal hunt uh, 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 sanctions, uh, anti-seal hunt sanctions. Uh, and I, I worked pro bono for a couple of NGOs. One of them was uh, the International Fund for Animal Welfare Canada. And the sing perhaps the single most effective piece of evidence in, in the case was produced by IFA Canada, which was an extremely graphic video that showed exactly ha how seals were brutally slaughtered on the Canadian ice fields. Because one of Canada's fundamental factual contentions was that uh, this idea that the seal hunt was cruel was just emotional. It was um, something stirred up by publicity-seeking celebrities and so on. And I was in the viewing room in the WTO when uh, that was shown to the panelists. And uh, I know that you know, looking in, and the, the quality of the viewing is very poor, but still, I knew looking into the faces of the panelists that two of the three panelists were very shook uh, by, that, uh, by that evidence. In the case of the law, you know, uh, you've already mentioned the principle that the tribunal knows the law. When you talk to appellate body members, uh, they make it very clear that they read very clear, they read very carefully not only the amicus submissions, but also many, many academic articles. But uh, they do not satisfy, I suppose, the vanity of many of us uh, who's, uh, by citing us explicitly. But so I think there is a kind of uh, uh, impact, but it's more in the brainstorming uh, of the appellate body to bring in ideas or arguments or frames of analysis that may not be brought in by the party. So you have to be content to be a kind of eminence grise, but we have to remember that the, the primary drafter of the GATT, the uh, 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 Hegelian uh, philosopher uh, Alexandre Khrushchev, was uh, himself content to be uh, an eminence uh, 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 Greece. Mm -hmm. <laughs> may, I, may I ask you, and then for another ten couple of minutes, also in order to, I, I without without discussion, well, the public. 
Okay. Yeah. So we will we will keep to the yeah. So Jean Claude uh, Laurence, yeah, yeah, of course. Laurence, please talk to Mike. Yeah, it's going to be a question mm. because I've. Now we've been discussing this morning about the role of uh, of judges and arbitrators, and this afternoon we are also looking at uh, the role of procedures and our function, and we are putting a lot of emphasis on the, uh, interpretation. Okay, and I was thinking, okay, so interpretation. So very often a tribunal or a court will say, I have an inherent power to do that and that, but then. The, the tribunal or the court is going to be looking at the statute or the rules and refer to And the question that I have is that how far can you go with that? And uh, should we Excuse apply, me, huh? how far could we, can we go in terms of interpretation? Mm. And are the courts and tribunals bound by the same rules than for substantive law norms, ma meaning the Vienna Convention or Article 31 and 32 with respect to the interpretation of procedural rules? Not and this would be interesting to discuss because uh, very often we don't really know what is the outer limits of the interpretative powers. Well, I would answer with chaos and that there is no limit you see to, to interpretation and uh, every judge is uh, really the law creator and uh, interpretation is just uh, you know a tool instrumental tool which can be bound to but anyway the uh, judge bonisho vous avez la dernière le dernier mot okay i think that we have limits and uh, and framework and uh, yeah. that uh, we create in some extent but uh, in, uh, in a limited extent and for example with a classical rules of interpretation uh, on the grounds of, uh, for example, of the logic uh, of the system of an act and so on. And uh, uh, it would be very difficult to, uh, uh, to go too far because uh, uh, one must keep in mind that uh, something fundamental for a, a body like, like uh, ours is that uh, case law has to be acceptable in the member states, acceptable. Yeah. I would just want to say that my remark about Kelsen was yeah, just right. provocative in order to, to <laughs> see really where yeah, the limit yeah. is between uh, interpretation <laughs> and uh, law creation. But, uh, so I thank all the participants very warmly. Yeah. Thank you. We come. And we finish really very, very on time. In the law. When the law should go in a certain direction.